Hi, I'm Henning Kaiser with Peking Robotics. Today I'm going to talk about the latest updates and future plans around the Move It for us to migration efforts. With me is Adam Pettinger from the Nuclear Robotics Group at the University of Texas. He will present his work around Move It Servo as part of his Google Summer of Code project at Picnic. I'll start with a quick status update on the development roadmap, highlighting the progress and the current milestone real time support. Adam will follow up on the Move It Servo as to migration along with a presentation of the latest features. After that, I will give a quick update about hybrid planning and about the upcoming hardware support integration efforts. I will finish up with the future outlook where I will quickly touch the milestone 3 and future versions and Debian releases. Here you see the development development of the Rust 2 migration efforts. Milestone 1, straight port to Rust 2, is completed as we reached feature parity with Move It 1. There is still some follow-up work regarding the port, but our focus is now fully on Milestone 2 real-time support. We are already making first steps for Milestone 3 as well, but I won't go into details for that today. For the straight migration, we reached a total of 558 of 62 fully migrated targets. The remaining targets are all either still incomplete in res 1 or would require decisively more work like the MoveIt setup assistant, which requires a full restructuring of MoveIt's launch and configuration system as planned for milestone 3. There are three runtime demos for Move Group, MoveIt CPP and MoveIt Servo that run on a simulated controller. We really invite everyone to test these and start building applications based on, based on them. Here you see the Move Group demo running in Arbor's you can test the motion planning panel just as you used to in the ROS1 version. It's basically everything there. You can design uh, your default states. You can drag around the interactive marker for creating your motion plans and execute the motion. The Move It CPP demo is a really basic application that runs a collision free motion plan using the Move It CPP interface. You can see that pretty much all the core features in MoveIt are used for this demo as it allows collision checking, running the planning pipeline, updating the planning scene, and executing motions on a simulated controller. Currently, we are working on Milestone 2 real-time support. This milestone consists of four objectives. Reactive, closely controlled to sensor input, separate global and local planner, also called hybrid planning, zero memory copy integration to controllers, and the integration of the PILS industry motion planner. The first objective, Reactive Closed Loop Control, is a new post-tracking API for running stable Cartesian motions on MoveIt Servo. This feature has already been completed and has been merged into MoveIt 1 a while ago. Uh, the only remaining work is to port it to Rust 2 with the upcoming sync. The second objective, the separate global local planner or hybrid planner, is currently being kicked off as a project by Sebastian Yar, who is working as an R&D student at Picnic. The current status is that the initial research is already completed, and Sebastian has started working on architecture design. Also, we are looking into selecting and testing planner candidates that can be used for the first prototypes. The completion of that intern program is planned for January 2021, so we expect first running demos pretty soon. Some more details on that I will give you in the hyper planning section. Objective 3, Rust 2 controllers or zero memory copy integration, has been a little bit on hold the last weeks. All of our demos are running on simulated Rust 2 controllers, but the integration was paused due to breaking API changes. But we are planning to continue this with more stable Rust 2 controlled versions. Also, this will definitely be part of the hardware integration efforts that we are running in the future. Uh, also, we are considering using some of the Rust 2 controllers as local planners, so in the hyper planning feature. The fourth objective is the integration of the PILS Industry Motion Planner. For Rust 1, the integration has already been completed. The PRs are there, we just need to get them merged and sync to Rust 2 as well. For those who don't know what this planner can do, it supports industry standard robot motions point-to-point, -point, linear, or circular motions, which can also be run in sequences using trajectory blending. We are really excited about this new feature as it provides a really deterministic way to run simple robot motions. 
Hi, my name is Adam Pettinger, and I'm a PhD student at the University of Texas at Austin. Today, I'll be giving a brief overview of MoveIt Servo and some recent developments there. I first kind of started with MoveIt Servo this last summer uh, when I did a Google Summer of Code project with Picnic. The goal of my project was to port Dragon to Rust 2 and then add tests and make general improvements. During the summer, we renamed Move It Jog Arm to Move It Servo, so I'll refer to it as Servo for the rest of this talk. We also moved Servo out of Move It Experimental and released it as an official part of Move It. And then, of course, uh, I ported it to ROS2 with some included demonstrations and some documentation. I'd like to quickly give a shout out to my mentors at Picnic, uh, Tyler and Andy, and then also a few other folks there who really helped me during the summer, uh, Henning and Jafar. Move It Servo is a real-time velocity streaming controller used to teleoperate the robotic manipulator. So we use the inverse Jacobian method to solve for uh, drive velocities, which is a pretty basic method, but works really well in this kind of teleoperation task. The input to Move It Servo is just a ROS message. So this allows a wide variety of input devices, including like a game controller. The left video shows me using it with a, uh, a VR hand tracker, but you can also publish to this topic with another ROS node so that some other part of your software can send um, commands to move a servo. Some of the features of servo is that it enforces the joint position of velocity limits, um, and then it slows down and stops as the manipulator approaches collision, both with the environment and with itself. And then it also slows down and stops as the manipulator approaches a singular configuration. Servo has been successfully run on real hardware uh, with a control rate of 125 hertz, and then another thread running uh, collision, the collision checking at 50 hertz. So it's it's pretty fast. Uh, the ROS2 version leverages the component design of ROS2 so that you can include um, a servo component as part of your larger project. And then the input to servo is a six degree freedom twist, uh, six degree freedom twist shown here. Um, the frame that that command is in can be adjusted on the fly. So you can change it while you are teleoperating. Additionally, both the input and output space, both of which are also in twists, uh, can be arbitrarily reduced and the that reduction can be done also on the fly. So the right video here shows the input frame uh, being adjusted. Uh, and then we are inputting commands on the, the two red axes and then switching between which coordinate frame the command is in. So you can kind of see that you can do this in real time. Uh, some common frames for inputting are the world frame or the ineffective frame, uh, but you can also, if you have a task, you can use the task frame, uh, et cetera. Reducing the input space um, allows for better use with what I call sloppy input devices like the VR hand tracker. And this video on the left shows one of my lab mates uh, trying to manipulate this valve in which um, we reduce the input space to servo as just the sort of the sideways direction where she's, she's moving it sideways. Uh, which is the sideways in the in the uh, end effector here as it goes around that arc. So this this means she doesn't have to be too precise with the hand controller, which is which is really hard with that kind of device. Reducing the output space allows you to drift in certain directions, uh, which means you can better avoid singularity or or uh, better reach. Uh, reach specific places at, at the cost of moving in others in other directions. I want to close with some recent work uh, being developed currently in ROS1 is, is pose tracking, which is basically to use move it servo with a closed loop controller to drive to a pose instead of following velocity commands. Uh, so this is hopefully uh, soon in ROS2, maybe by the time of this talk. But it basically allows you to send poses to move our servo instead of velocities, uh, which will be good for, for instance, going to nearby points. So you might want to, to move the ineffector forward 100 millimeters to get a better view of something, or uh, move to a, a grasp point nearby, or um, 
even while you're already in contact with the environment. So with the, with the valve from the last slide, a good example would be after you've grabbed it, it's not hard to imagine sending another pose that's, that's rotated 90 and just having the robot um, move there automatically. Uh, so with that, I would like to close and um, hand it back to Henning, thanks. In this section, I'm going to explain what the hyperplanning feature is and what kind of applications we hope to solve with it in the future. First of all, we are trying to solve two different planning problems with one architecture. One is adaptive motions and the second is reactive motions. Both motions are represented by two examples. The adaptive motion is a motion that adapts to sensor input in real time. Imagine you're drawing on a chalkboard and you have to apply a certain amount of pressure while you're drawing. You have a global planner that defines the motion for drawing let the letters. A local planner applies the right pressure for applying a certain amount of force on the, on the board. Uh, an example for a reactive motion is steering around a new collision object in this scene. If you have a global planner for um, running a trajectory that might be invalidated at a time, you need to replan the trajectory. The local planner could try to keep clear from objects using field-based distance minimization. The, the difference between adaptive motions and reactive motion is therefore that adaptive motions just react on a local scale. The global plan stays the same. And reactive motions can replan both the global and the local plans. More precisely, hyperplanning is a term that yeah, it's a term for an architecture that, that allows running global and local plans simultaneously at different speeds. Global planners are usually running full collision checks at a much lower frequency. Local planners should run really, really fast as they are used to be um, com compute the joint commands for controllers, for instance. Um, if possible, local planners should also allow for space planning. Example applications are human-robot collaborations where humans can change the environment while the robot is moving, painting a wall where you need to apply a certain amount of pressure while already knowing that the global plan will cover all of the wall, filling a dishwasher where you know where to apply the dishes but you don't want to apply too much pressure while filling it in, or balancing a tray while placing it on the table. You know the motion of the tray but you don't know exactly how to balance it while you're moving. These are examples for hyperplanning uh, applications or problems that need some kind of global and local planning to really be robust and successful in the real world. There are some basic terms and requirements that need to be given for global and local planning. Um, a global planner usually can plan around complex obstacles, avoids getting stuck in local minima, and if it is complete, it will find a solution if it exists. Uh, usually a global planner is slower in computation time. Uh, it doesn't allow real-time planning as it really solves complicated problems. And it is mm, not always deterministic. It can be, but it doesn't really have to be. A local planner is therefore something more trivial. It is more like a Jacobian-based planner. It is fast and reactive. It is deterministic. And it should be suited for things like visual servering, where you just have a local problem you try to um, minimize the cost function to a local goal. The cons is uh, it might get stuck in local minima. That's the difference to the global planner. And it might have fewer collision safety guarantees. Here is a draft of the first architecture design. Uh, at the point of the talk, this might have already changed, but it might give you a first idea of how the planner will be structured. The basic interface will be given by a planner manager that allows uh, handling planning requests similar to the current motion planning pipeline. The global and local planners will be run as plugins or component nodes, which both have access to one real-time interface, uh, allowing to read and write a global planning problem at the same time. Also, both planners have access to the planning scene, which gives and updates information about the world. The local planner also is used for computing the robot controller commands. So it might write joint states to the robot controller, it might publish Cartesian goals to the controller, if it's Cartesian controller, it really depends on what kind of setup you're running. Also, local planners tend to process sensor inputs as well. Of course, there might be setups where global planners can also work with sensor inputs, but usually when we talk about sensor inputs, it's something that we want to react immediately to. 
In this section, I'm going to show some examples of hardware's integration efforts and what the changes are with really adopting Rust 2 applications. When it comes to hardware and Rust 2, it's something like a chicken and egg problem. Uh, the Rust 2 user adoption is driven by hardware support, but hardware support requires user adoption. So when you talk to Rust developers who have been around for a while, they often say that Rust 2 isn't ready for development. But in the end, someone needs to make a start. And we try to yeah, bring that forward by running the first motions uh, with Boovit on hardware. For that, we are really happy that we are collaborating with Hello Robot and the Stretch Robot to show a full rounded demonstration of Rust 2 capabilities. This platform pretty much has everything that a mobile robot would have. Uh, it has a moving base, a manipulator, a gripper, sensor input. So we are really excited to get going with this and get a full demo working. Here's an interesting uh, application by Prozima, who managed to get a micro ROS MU sensor to uh, publish motion targets for uh, Move It To. At this point, uh, this demo might not look like too impressive, but in the future we want to use this sensor input for real-time jogging so that we can showcase that Rust 2 with DDS allows really fast and robust sensor input, which can be used for online jogging as well. In this last section, I'll quickly touch milestone three of our development roadmap and share some plans about future releases and versions. Milestone three, fully leveraged Rust 2, is really about applying all Rust 2 features that are completely different from Rust 1. This includes lifecycle management of move it nodes and leverage Rust 2 component nodes. Also related to that is cleaning up the API. And the focus here is that MoveIt will be re-implemented as a set of standalone nodes that can be run as component nodes. At this point, I'm really happy to share our plans for future versions and releases. We are starting to release MoveIt2 for Foxy every six weeks, which is uh, in sync with an automatic release. Also, we are now fully supporting Windows and OS X and are working on enabling CI for both. The main branch is switching to rolling Ridley so that we are always up to date with the latest ROS changes and might run continuous releases in the future as well. You see there's a lot going on uh, in Move It 2, and we really need all the help we can get. Thanks a lot. I'm really excited for your questions.